All right, just a quick one before we get going. So please don't take anything you hear in today's episode as financial advice. Please speak to a trained professional if you do wish to participate in markets. Crypto is inherently risky and you will lose all your money, particularly if you listen to us for financial direction. So enough of that. Please give us a like, subscribe, enjoy the show and see you next time. All right, welcome back. Another episode of the Blockmates podcast. And today we've got probably one of the most anticipated projects in the whole space that everyone keeps talking about. And we've managed to drag Jay on from Say Labs, Say Network, all that kind of good stuff. But Jay, how are we doing? Doing well, man. It's been a crazy day. <laughs> we were just previously chatting off. Like I complain about having like a, a media company have to kind of coordinate probably about 12 to 13 people across the planet. And you guys are trying to run a distributed system whilst running uh, an upgrade, which is probably probably industry defining. <laughs> we were saying how difficult it is to kind of yeah, align. I mean, it has definitely well. been a, it's just been a fun past six months. I'll say that. It's, it's also really <laughs> cool that like everything is like, things are just moving in crypto. So I think there's just this energy that was not there this time last year. Yeah, is it... Um, I suppose it's more difficult to build now because of the chaos that is happening in the markets and it's like everyone gets frantic and you know sometimes like in a bear market and down market you kind of remove that noise so interestingly for the say labs team i feel like it's still it's still the exact same pace that we're moving at um we tend to not really focus much on a lot of external things so there's less noise for um like the devs and i think we've been able to exact like operate at the exact same pace as before sick so um I think we, we did something on spaces a long t- a long time ago, um, but mm. I, I'd like to just kind of set the scene because I think there's a good kind of segue based on, on your backstory. And I know some people don't like the whole backstory stuff, but bear with me, there is a good segue here. So can, can you fill people <laughs> in on, on your on your background and um, why it made sense to kind of go ahead and build what you're building now? Of course. So my name is Jay. I'm a co-founder over at Say Labs. Uh, my story is that I grew up in the Bay Area so in the San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley, um, met my co-founder through speech and debate back in high school. And I initially got into crypto uh, back in 2017. So at that time, my roommate, he was going through Binance Labs. Uh, both of us ended up taking on a couple of different smart contracts uh, together. And that's how I initially got into the building side for crypto. Um, I guess I also ended up studying computer science in college. And back in 2017, I ended up finding out about, I both found out about Robinhood and I also ended up chatting with their team back then. Um, So back then, 2017 Robinhood, it was basically just two houses essentially across the street. Um, This was back in Palo Alto. And one of the houses, it literally took like the bedrooms in the house. They set up standing desks over there and that's where the teams work from. Like they would have like one engineering team, like one of these these rooms. Um, So this is right around the time that they had raised their series C. So it was like one of the hottest companies in the Bay Area at the time. Like there's every company in the Bay Area, like everything is very cyclic in the Bay Area. And like for companies like Robinhood, like the Series B, Series C, C time is like when they are the hottest companies to be working at. Um, and actually looking back at it now, so the new grad class after that fundraise was done was around 20 people. Um, I think eight of those people have started venture back companies. So it's just a like really, really kind of, I think different environment than you would, what you would see at like most um, other companies for new grad classes. So back then it was just like everyone was coming over from places like uh, Pinterest, Airbnb, Google, Facebook, Citadel, Jump. So it was just like a really, really exciting place to be. Um, so I initially ended up joining Robinhood because there were a lot of really smart people there. Um, and I spent almost four years over there. Um, I started off as a software engineer, eventually became an engineering lead. And I was an engineering lead when the entire GameStop saga happened back in 2021. So for any listeners that might not really um, remember, um, what was happening back then is there was a bunch of people that were buying into stocks like GameStop, AMC, and roughly like 10 other stocks. And these stocks were essentially like pumping to the stratosphere. Like initially it was fundamentals driven where there were people like um, Keith Gill, uh, who was like, he was on Wall Street Bets. He was talking about like, oh, like just based off fundamentals, um, GameStop is like undervalued at $5. And he was just like posting stuff on Wall Street bets every, I think it was like every month or so he was like posting an update. Um, initially it was fundamentals driven. Then afterwards it just became this entire kind of like community frenzy where it's like, we all like the stock. And then there were also <laughs> sophisticated traders like hedge funds, for example, um, that saw this act, that saw this happening. And they're like, this makes literally no sense. 
like after a certain point, the amount of like price action that was happening, which is completely like uh, disjoint from reality. Um, so because of that, like a lot of hedge funds started shorting Robinhood and or shorted uh, shorting GameStop and these other meme stocks. And the way that shorting works is you have to borrow the stock, then you sell it immediately. And then afterwards you have to buy it back and then return it. So if the price goes down, that's fine. If the price goes up, you actually need to buy it back at a higher price and then return it. But when you buy it, that leads to more buy pressure. So there's this concept of a short squeeze where a bunch of people have short positions, the stock price is going up, then they need to buy back the stock. But when they buy it, that leads to more upward price action. So other people have to um, do the same thing. So that was happening. And it was this very like um, true Robin Hood type of moment where it's like the um, rich, like you're essentially taking from the rich and giving to like normal everyday people. And like Robin Hood was at the center of all of this. Like Robin Hood was the place where all of this activity was happening. And then one day, just out of the blue, I think it was like January 28th of 2021, so sometime in that range, um, Robin Hood just decided to turn off buys. And this was just like completely out of the blue for the community. Like no one was anticipating this. Everyone was like super excited to go on Robin the next day and like start trading GameStop. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just completely out of the blue. So as an insider at Robin Hood at the time, I didn't really have any idea that this was happening. Um, I would find out about things at the exact same time that they told the rest of the world. And it just makes you feel completely powerless, right? Because yeah. you put your reputation on the line to join a place like Robinhood because you're like, oh shit, there's hella smart people working here. Um, you join that place and then you just have like no idea what's happening behind the scenes. Um, your team comes to you with questions. You have nothing to be telling them. Your friends that are also like, I mean, as uh, someone in their early 20s at the time, most of my friends were following along with this or actively trading GameStop. Um, so a lot of people reached out to me and it's like, well, I have nothing to be telling you either. So kind of going through that entire process, um, it made me feel a little bit more jaded with the traditional financial system. Um, it is very, very centralized. There's a lot of like very centralized actors that are involved in the process. And like from like, even from like the Robin Hood side, it was like a few people in a room that were calling the shots and I had no idea what was happening behind the scenes. Um, that made me much more of a decentralization maxi. Like anything that happens in a decentralized way is inherently trustless. And I think that avoids a lot of the issues that we saw happening um, with Robinhood. So that was the original inspiration for everything. Um, that's what led to us starting to build stuff on chain. And yeah, I mean, uh, happy to go more into the say story after that. Yeah, that's absolutely crazy because that's such a unique um, perspective of what was a kind of crazy time in the markets. And um, the did you catch the did you catch the movie Dumb Money? Uh, was it? On yeah, Netflix yeah, recently? yeah. I watched that recently. <laughs> It's a great movie. I think that some parts of it weren't totally accurate, but overall it was like yeah. very sensational. Yeah, never let a lie get in the way of a good story. <laughs> 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 um, but what I found was, and I, I'd heard that story before and I thought it was like such a unique perspective from a founder, particularly in this space, but I think it's very topical of what's actually happening and it has kind of connotations of what's happening in the, in the crypto markets now where everyone's, who's coming to the markets um at this point in time there's kind of this extreme focus on meme coins for better or for worse um but i just wanted to kind of get your opinion on as someone who's building like the infrastructure to allow uh, an ecosystem to flourish what kind of role do you think meme coins and more speculative assets and things like that play in an ecosystem yeah so, I mean, for meme coins specifically, I think they're playing a role similar to what NFTs played in the last cycle, um, where they are a community building mechanism. And what I mean by that is everyone that is like rallying behind these different coins, part of it is they are rallying behind a coin. Um, part of it is tied to money. Um, but I think at the heart of it, it is more like getting around a community. Um, and I think it's identical to what we saw happening with GameStop. Like initially it was like kind of, Part of it definitely is financial driven, but I think a lot of it is just like community formation. And I think over the rest of this year, we will see meme coins become a similar type of vehicle as NFTs in a way, where there are mechanisms for bringing people together and like mechanism for like community formation. So a, a lot of the stuff that we saw happening with NFTs in terms of like people trying to have more um, like join these communities and then like have these community driven events, like we're starting to see versions of that right now as well. I think it was either like yesterday or the day before that, where there was the dog with hat um, kind of 
Uh, people are trying to get it on the sphere in Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> that is extremely reminiscent of what we saw happening with NFTs last cycle as well. So yeah, I mean, short, short answer there is like NFTs or meme coins are kind of similar to NFTs um, where they're community building tools. Yeah, it's, it's exact same thoughts and called them like this cycles NFTs without JPEGs attached to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. But it's, it's quite strange because like um, to go like a step further, the like ecosystems are, are definitely recognizing that as a customer acquisition channel and a customer acquisition um, like source. And like you even seen like native apps on, on, on Solana by integrating the fundraising page with inside the phantom app to kind of get mm -hmm. this, like to get dog with half on hat onto the sphere. So I thought it's just like a weird, it's, it's a weird shift in what's happening, but I think it's like the appetite is obviously there. And if it's an onboarding tool, then like it is what it is. Um, exactly. So can you kind of, cause say it's going through this like huge upgrade and iteration, but I'd like to kind of give people a high level of what it has been and what it is currently before we kind of get into V2. Cause there's a lot to pick apart on say V2. Of course. So say went live, say V1, it went live in August of 2023. So that's like around seven months ago now. Um, and since that time, it has been the fastest blockchain that has been created just point blank. Um, it's seen 390 millisecond finality, which is faster than Solana. It's faster than like Aptos. It's faster than essentially any chain um, that you can think of. So that has been going exceptionally well. Um, one of the biggest learnings that we had after the V1 launch is that the EVM is here to stay. That is like one of the core things that we built conviction around. And that is like one of the core, I guess, theses, one of the core learnings that we've had. Um, and what I mean by that, so for any listeners that might not know, um, the EVM is the Ethereum virtual machine. It's what's used to process transactions on Ethereum and I mean dozens of other blockchains. Um, it's like the default kind of execution environment that people use. And right now, 87% of crypto native engineers, they use the EVM. So essentially everyone uses the EVM right now. The remaining 13%, they're largely on Solana using C-level runtime. And I mean, other execution environments like, uh, for example, Move would be one example, um, FuelVM, Cosmosm, uh, they don't really have much activity at all. So the question is then like, how do you get these, if you're building something that doesn't have the EVM, how do you get someone to leave the EVM and start building in your new execution environment? Uh, the simple answer there is you don't. Like people do not leave the EVM. And that's because the EVM isn't just a tech stack. Um, there's a lot more going on with the EVM. There's the entire community. There's this entire like way of thinking. And initially I would think that it's like, okay, it's not just a tech stack, it's an ecosystem. But I'm starting to think more and more now that it's not just an ecosystem either. The closest comparison over here would be a religion. like. The way that people think about the EVM, it is much more similar to a religion than anything else. Um, and I mean, obviously it's like a capitalist take on a religion, so it's definitely not the same thing, um, but it's extremely difficult to get people to convert. So th that's like one of the core learnings we had. Um, the question we asked ourselves is like, what is actually missing from the EVM right now? And the biggest pain point of the EVM is a lack of throughput. If you go to the Ethereum L1, if you go to any rollup built on top of Ethereum, you're not able to get more than 50 sustained transactions per second that you can process. And that is very low. With 50 TPS, there's a couple of problems that happen. Um, the first problem is that you start having much higher gas fees. And you see this on Ethereum L1 all the time. Like when, I mean, very recently we've had Gwei, like I think it hit like 160 or 170 Gwei in the past couple of weeks. Um, when shit like that happens, right? Like the average person is just completely priced out. You cannot mm -hmm. do like 99.9% .9 of the world cannot go on chain and spend like $150 to just do a swap on Uniswap. Like that is just, that is unacceptable. Um, so it, it prices out the normal user. And on top of that, it limits the design space for developers. Like developers now need to start figuring out how to make things work in this like really constricted environment. So there's a lot of anti-patterns that they have to start using to make things work. Um, one example of that would be AMMs, so automated market makers. Um, this is a construction that is not used at all in traditional finance, um, but it's very popular on-chain. And the reason for that 
is that in traditional finance, like, I mean, from a high level standpoint, AMMs are not capital efficient. Like order book based designs tend to be better for actually trading. Um, but AMMs do work in the constraints that you have with the EBM. So that's why uh, projects like Uniswap have taken off. Um, so there's, I guess, several problems that are there with the EBM right now. Um, the question then becomes like, how do you actually solve those? And that's exactly where SEBI comes in. Um, the way that we're solving that with SEBI 2 is by paralyzing the EVM. And by doing this, we are able to increase throughput. So I guess I'll just kind of give a high level overview and then kind of uh, let you deep dive into the questions there. But um, the EVM right now, if you look at any existing chain, um, it's single threaded. So if you have 100 transactions that are coming in, they'll all get run one after the other. Um, and this is like really simple uh, for engineers to write code around. Like it's really simple from a software engineering standpoint, um, but it does not take advantage of modern hardware. Like the laptops or phones that people are listening to this on, um, those are devices that have multiple cores and they can process multiple work streams at the same time. So it's extremely inefficient to have this like modern hardware and have software that is not able to take advantage of that. And that's exactly what we do with parallelization. Um, with parallelization, we're able to process multiple work streams at the same time. So like one high level example would be if there's, let's say hundred transactions coming in, each transaction takes 10 milliseconds. Um, with sequential processing, that would be hundred transactions times 10 milliseconds. So that's a thousand milliseconds, AKA a second to process all of them. Um, with parallelism, let's say you're able to process 10 transactions simultaneously. Um, then you're going to be able to do it 10 times faster. So instead of a thousand milliseconds, it'll take a hundred milliseconds. Um, so that's the massive speed up, right? And that's exactly what we're doing with SEBI 2. We're paralyzing the EVM to help get better throughput, which will then decrease fees and also increase the developer design space. I see, you see there's like a, a large push towards this and, and Solana has certain aspects of parallelization, but it isn't just an easy task to just say, oh, we're just going to handle like a lot of separate transactions in, in parallel and then just bundle them all up and then put them together. So like what are like some of the... Have you, have you stumbled upon anything in building this out that you kind of didn't foresee? Like what are some of the more difficult aspects of actually getting a parallel EVM execution environment to actually work that people from the outside looking in probably wouldn't think were was a difficult mm -hmm. aspect of it? Yeah. So Solana is actually an interesting point that you brought up. I guess a high level way for people to think about what we're building with CAB2 is essentially combining Ethereum and Solana. Um, we were able to get the EVM and all the tooling, mindshare, community around it, um, while having this super high performance execution environment um, that you get with Solana. So I, I think that's kind of the right mental model that people can have around V2. Um, I would say the biggest trade-off that you're making or like the biggest thing you need to account for um, when you're building a paralyzed, like basically any high performance chain um, is state load. And that's something that like a lot of people might not be super familiar with like, and I think that's one thing that you really need to be thoughtful about before you're actually able to build any kind of like paralyzed chain. Um, so state, I guess kind of like taking a step back, um, state is all of the data that needs to persist on a blockchain um, to be able to generate the state route, uh, which is used for the block header and to be able to process any new transactions. Um, so this would be essentially two types of data. Uh, the first is account balances. Like I have 10 say, you have 20 say, um, and this would also be smart contract state. Like it could be an NFT contract. It would be mapping like this token, uh, this ID, it belongs to like this user, for example. Um, so all of this data needs to persist on chain. It needs to be there for every full node. And it's like essentially necessary to have. Um, when you have more transactions that are being processed, that leads to more state writes that happen, um, which results in essentially more data that you need to be writing to state. And there's just more data that needs to be tracked. Um, and that's a problem with state flow. And there essentially end up being two things that you need to be thoughtful about. Um, the first is state storage. Like when the state size increases, how do you actually store all that state on these full nodes? Um, if it's like one gigabyte, that's very simple. But if it starts ballooning, it gets to be like, let's say 10 terabytes, um, then suddenly the same full nodes that you were using before, they will not necessarily be able to handle that type of state. And, It'll result in more centralizing forces because there'll be less people that can run full nodes and that'll have um, its own set of trade-offs. Um, the second thing that happens is state sync becomes much more difficult. So when you start to run a new node, let's say you're going to be running a new validator 
or you want to start spinning up a new full node, you need to import the state of the current blockchain to be able to start processing new transactions. Um, if there's like, let's say 10 terabytes of state, that becomes a pretty difficult task to like import everything and then also account for all the new blocks that are coming in and uh, it becomes difficult to do so quickly. So it could suddenly start taking like days to sync um, to the current state of the blockchain. And that's a pretty terrible developer experience. And it can also have other issues. Like if you need to wipe a validator and like start re like restart it, then there could be issues tied to that as well if it mm -hmm. takes too long to set it up. Um, so the way that we uh, have accounted for that is through SADB. Um, so SADB essentially has two parts to it. Uh, the first is a memory mapped IVL tree. And the second is async writes that are happening to disk. Um, I can get into those if they're, I guess, interesting to talk about. But at a high level, just through these improvements that we made, we're able to get a 60% reduction in state size. So state storage decreases dramatically. We're able to get a 1,200% improvement in state sync. So it becomes much faster to sync any new nodes that are being spun up. And we also observed a 287x improvement in um, commit times. So it became much faster to actually process blocks that are coming in. So, so, so when when people like, because obviously this is going to kind of change the way that a lot of people have have kind of operated, particularly if they've only been on Ethereum and L2 or like EVM equivalent chain, and then they they start using SAP2 and they're like, oh well. But a lot of people might be asking, well, what's actually what's actually going on under the hood? And like the most basic example, which everyone uses in like parallel systems, is well, if there's an NFT mint happening that's kind of chaotic and there's a bit of a gas war going on on one one aspect of the chain, and let's say there's a lending and borrowing protocol that's trying to liquidate like a huge a huge position, like what's actually happening under the hood to enable those two transactions that operate in parallel, that they don't congest each other, and the lending and borrowing protocol doesn't into a bad debt because the gas fees are, are too high because of the NFT and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So there's essentially two ways to support parallelism. Um, the first is by having dependencies be defined up front. And the second is by having the chain figure out the dependencies. So if you look at Solana, it'd be like one of the most canonical examples of having dependencies be defined up front. Um, each Solana transaction needs to include all the state that it thinks it's going to be touching. And then based off of whatever state each transaction passes along, um, you're able to figure out like, okay, these two transactions are not touching the same state. So they do not have any overlap because shared state is like the primary thing that leads to um, transactions needing, needing to be run sequentially. Um, like if we're trying to do two completely separate things, like there's an NFT mint and then there's liquidation, these are not touching the same state so they can be run at the same time. So um, having developers define dependencies up front is one approach. Um, the downside with this approach is that it's a lot more complicated for the developer experience. Um, so it like requires developers to do a lot of work. It's not super intuitive. Um, in the case of EVM, it also doesn't end up being backwards compatible. Like if you take something that is there on Ethereum L1, you try to deploy it directly to a chain that requires you to have uh, dependencies dependencies be defined. You can't just like change the RPC to the front end is hitting. You need to like change the way that transactions are submitted from the front end, um, you might need to change the way trend, uh, smart contracts are written as well. So it adds a lot more friction to the developer experience. Um, the other way is by having the changes figure out what these dependencies are. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing with SAVI2. So this is called optimistic parallelism. Uh, and the way that it works under the hood is all the transactions, let's say there's 100 transactions in a block, all of these transactions will get run in parallel initially. And then we see what state is being read and what state is being written to. Um, so there's 100 transactions. We know what state each of them is touching. Then we can see which ones have overlaps, like which ones are touching, trying to access the same state. Um, if two like if one transaction is touching a state, no one else is touching it, that can be committed. If there's 10 transactions touching the same state, then you can commit the first one. And then for the remaining nine, you need to rerun all nine of those. Um, so in the worst case, this can result, like let's say there's 100 transactions, they're all touching the same thing. This can, in the worst case, result in transactions being rerun several times, um, with like 100 transactions to be rerunning them 99 times. Um, but one thing to keep in mind over here is that because you've already loaded all the state that's being accessed um, into memory, it makes it much more performant to be able to actually process these transactions after the first time. Um, so with all this being said, the developer experience ends up being much better with this because the chain is just able to figure things out. 
And I think that's like the biggest thing that needs to be optimized for. Um, the harder the developer experience is, the harder it is to grow an ecosystem. And that's why the optimistic parallelism approach is definitely the better approach to be using. Yeah, I did always did always wonder how that um, actually worked. And, and like how, if you guys did any kind of, I'm sure you have, but how kind of multi-threaded can, can that actually get? Because I, I think there's like limited kind of um, threads on specific chains that are trying to do this kind of thing. But like if you kind of ran some tests and like thought about if there's like an arbitrary number around how how, how kind of multi-threaded this this kind of approach can get with um, optimistic parallelization, parallelization. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, if there's like n number of cores on the machine, it'll be able to parallelize across every single one of those n cores. Um, I mean, in terms of like more uh, concrete numbers to give to you, um, we ran load tests with like fully work, uh, parallelizable work streams. So this is just like token transfers that are happening back and forth across like completely separate accounts. Um, we observed 5,030 TPS with these load tests. Um, there's like some pretty clear improvements to be making to get it even higher in the future. Um, with Ethereum right now, you're seeing around 50 TPS as the upper bound for like what rollups using Ethereum for DA are able to get. Um, so for more concrete numbers, you're able to get roughly 100x improvement in throughput. Um, and this is accounting for like everything that needs to happen. Um, this is accounting for like the P2P gossip layer. This is accounting for consensus. This is accounting for like generating the state root and everything as well. So um, if you're looking just at like pure execution, it's going to be even higher than 100x um, compared to Ethereum. Great. And um, I, we touched upon it slightly there, but let's say like V2, V2 goes live and everything is now set in stone for, I don't know, your uni swaps and your curves and like all, all the kind of big DeFi players and all the NFT projects and things like that. What does that portability look like? Is there any additional lift whatsoever? Is it just kind of 100% kind of translatable over to say V2? Like, how does that look? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so under the hood, we're making use of get. Um, so get is what is used to process, I think, around 85% of transactions on Ethereum L1 right now. So it is the most battle-tested execution client that Ethereum has to offer. Um, under the hood, we're making use of get for full EVM bytecode compatibility. Um, so any opcode that you need to use or that is being used on Ethereum L1, it will just work um, say v2. So what this means for like contract, like smart contract app developers, is you can take your smart contract from the Ethereum L1 deploy it to say, uh, all you need to do is change whatever the RPC is. Uh, and then you go to your front end, you change what RPC is being used, and then um, everything essentially just works. I would say the uh, like the big difference between Say's approach and what is there to be like, what is described in the Ethereum yellow paper uh, would be that Say makes use of an IVL tree. And the Ethereum yellow paper uh, talks about a MPT, a Merkle Patricia tri. Um, so that would be the primary difference, but in terms of like where like how that manifests, it would only result in like differences in the proof that is generated. Um, for most applications, that doesn't matter at all. But if you're building tooling that makes use of any kind of proofs, then you need to update uh, like how you are processing those proofs. So if that's on a smart contract, you need to change the code for that. If it's some off-chain tooling, then you need to change how you process those. But um, at this point, there's like a public devnet that is live for say. Uh, none of the projects that have deployed there have had any issues. So this is something that affects most likely very small minority of projects. Yeah, because I bet there's um there's so many projects that are just as I say working with the infrastructure that they've got and like their their application could probably reach infinitely greater heights given a parallelized system. So I bet exactly. that developers are all flying over there to try it out. Exactly. And I think it ends up being like even more exciting for people that are trying to build completely new things. Um, because if you take something that works on Ethereum, you port it over uh, to say V2, uh, the biggest benefit there will be lower gas fees. Um, but now you have like this 100x improvement in throughput. So there's like an entirely new design space of applications you can build um, that have much higher verifiability and much higher uh, trustlessness and decentralization guarantees than you would be able to get on Ethereum. Like some examples of this would be like a order book based exchange. Uh, where you have everything happening on chain. Um, what is historically needed to happen on Ethereum is you have some kind of like off chain uh, order matching engine, which has like much higher centralization requirements. Like it's essentially just like on AWS controlled by one entity. Um, so now you can move away and start having that happen entirely on chain. Um, a couple of other examples would be like some kind of social media application where you have like every single action that happens, like every single comment 
um, going on chain uh, instead of needing to be in some kind of like separate network and then only having like a smaller portion of data living on chain. Um, and I guess the third example would be games. So instead of having like a lot of games right now, they just have like NFTs that are traded or tokens that are traded. Um, that part lives on chain and the rest of the game logic lives off chain. But you can have much higher verifiability by having every single action just get submitted on chain. Um, so there's like an entirely new design space for what you theoretically can do now. Yeah, because it's quite interesting that the the decks and particularly the MM space is kind of been forced down into a more RFQ intense based system purely down to liquidity providers inherently not being profitable or just eating like an ungodly amount of impairment loss or loss versus rebalance as we're calling it now. Um, and that's kind of forcing like you've even seen like Uniswap or Uniswap X, they're kind of, kind of switching to this like RFQ model. They're kind of outsourcing what they want the next iterations of the AMM to be with Uniswap V4 and hooks and everything like that. So it kind of feels like they're at a little bit of a loose end, but maybe it's like it has to come at the infrastructure layer and the execution layer to enable that next kind of development and push towards like central limit order book style model that we know is tried and trusted and, and can, can support like long tail assets as well, which obviously people love. But um, it, it does feel like the MM space is definitely hamstrung by the um, network that it's, it's currently built on. Yeah. So you're saying that like, because there's so much, like there's already strong network effects right now. So it's harder to move off of that, right? Yeah, and I, oh, I mean, like you're you can, saying, like the L1 itself that it's built on. Yeah, so like obviously mm, MM's yeah. been great. Anyone can list any any specific asset. It can be long tail. It can be like fat tail. It can be absolutely anything. Um, yeah. But what you what you've kind of seen it in the same week of Uniswap announcing that the release in Uniswap before they also released Uniswap X. Yeah. Um, which is request for quote where. It's like an opaque system where it's filling, getting filled by probably wouldn't mute off chain, <laughs> but yeah. it's self custody. Um, and then it's just pushed it towards these more centralization, centralizing forces because it is hamstrung by the very nature of being a sequential yeah. system based on an AMM. And it's just like, so it's, it's very interesting to see that if you change the underlying infrastructure, that you can then have more power, powerful systems, such as yeah. uh, an order book, which would make sense. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think for several types of dApps right now, um, the underlying infrastructure, the underlying network is a limitation. Um, I do think that if you have higher throughput, uh, there will be much more experimentation happening. That doesn't mean that like inefficient models from the current will like suddenly disappear. Like I think AMMs do have a place on chain. Uh, there's other benefits that they offer as well, such as like having uh, making it much easier to like uh, support long tail assets. Um, but I, I do agree with your point that like when you have better infrastructure, you will be able to experiment a lot more. Yeah, and the, the, I'm not even going to go down the route, but like with MEV and everything, that's like the uh, I've seen some of the numbers recently, and that just kind of blew my mind how much people are losing out to um, MEV. But that's a conversation yeah. for another day. <laughs> um, so you've kind of also came out with this recent announcement about the parallel stack. Um, and I don't think you've talked about it previously publicly on a podcast, so I'd love to kind of pick your brain on what that is like high level. And I've kind of got some additional questions to kind of tap into that. Of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, we actually announced this earlier today. Uh, so the announcement was at 6 a.m. Pacific time. So I got up, uh, nice and early for that. Um, and I mean, kind of at a high level, like how we're thinking about this is that right now we're building the first paralyzed CVM, um, and this is essentially going to be like with SAVI2, it's going to be a change that we're making to the core L1. So for several different types of applications, this ends up being the perfect place to deploy. Um, specifically, if you're building something that's like a smart contract application um, that you want to deploy on a general purpose chain, uh, SAVI2 ends up being fantastic. Um, there's a separate class of developers that want to have their own dedicated block space. And specifically, they want their own dedicated block space in a very high performance type of execution environment. And currently, there's not really a good way to get that with the EVM. So they'll either have to convert and use like some other type of execution environment that theoretically could offer a greater throughput, um, or they they can't really they don't really have any other option. Um, and that's exactly what um, the parallel stack allows people to do. Um, it takes what we've already been building with ZB2, and it makes it so that anyone that is trying to build their own um, layer two blockchain 
specifically a layer two that is not using Ethereum for data availability. Um, they will be able to take the innovation that we've had with optimistic paralyzi uh, parallelization uh, with SADB and then use that to get a very high performance um, execution environment for them to work with. Um, and I mean, this is kind of like a natural next step for SID. Like our goal is to scale the EVM. And there's this way that we've been working on of building SAV2. And this is like a natural next step from taking SAV2's execution environment and then making that accessible to a lot of people. Because like this is already completely open source tech. Uh, there's already people that want to make use of it. So it ends up being very aligned to just make it as easy as possible um, for teams to make use of what we've already built in an open source way. Yeah, because the obviously we're starting to see a huge push towards kind of people being able to have this modular stack now. And I think it's it's much, much greater for people to be able to kind of just tap into like really great teams that are building in a specific aspect of the stack. Like obviously everyone's using Celestia or EigenDA for data availability. Um, you're starting to see some additional um, shared sequencer layers come online. And now this just feels like, right. So this is, instead of just being hamstrung by everything else under, underneath the hoods going on that is pushing the industry forward in the right direction, why are we such a settling for like a sequential EVM? Um, but exactly. there was an aspect of, of the article that I read where there is also a shared sequencer layer, if I'm not mistaken, is, is that correct? And I'd love to kind yeah, of just so, pick, your brain, pick your brain on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the right mental model here would be this is in some ways similar to OP stack, um, mm -hmm. where there is like an opt-in shared sequencer that you can make use of if you want to. Um, but fundamentally, it is a way for you to build your own blockchain. And you as the application, you, you as a blockchain developer, um, can choose what parts of the stack you want to. Um, so you can use the parallel stack for the execution layer. You can use Celestia for D8. You can have Ethereum settlement. Um, and then you can choose however you want to have the sequencer be set up. Um, if you do decide to use the say sequencer set, um, then you will be able to benefit from interoperability. Uh, but as a developer, you kind of control um, however you want this to be, um, however you want your chain to be set up. And to your core point, like I fundamentally think that if you can have, um, like if you're a developer and you have to choose, and you have the option essentially to choose between a single threaded EVM and then a paralyzed EVM, then you will 100% of the time pick the parallelized EVM because it is just significantly faster. Um, and it just leads to a much better user experience and a much bigger design space for any developers that are building on top as well. So it's kind of a no brainer to go with a parallelized EVM. And, and that's why it's honestly pretty surprising um, that no one has been working on this so far um, because it is just like whoever is able to build the first parallelized EVM for layer two to make use of and whoever is able to um, essentially make it easy for people to uh, use this uh, like execution environment in an easy way. Um, you'll essentially become the default choice for anyone that's trying to build a layer two because it's just significantly better. So I think that they're like supporting the parallel stack um, and to being really effective to help developers just offer much better user experiences. So there's two like um, adjacent questions I've got here. So the first one, um, for existing L2s, which are obviously <laughs> running a sequential EVM currently, is there any, or am I kind of like living in like a, a fairyland here? W would it be possible for backwards compatibility or is this something that you'd kind of have to build from the ground up and or like or fork off? Like what does that kind of look like if even if it's just a hypothetical situation? Yeah, I think that depends on the specific implementation details, which haven't really been announced yet. Um, so there'll be more updates around that in the future. Um, but ideally, it would be something that is backwards compatible. Um, that is not super trivial to do, though. Okay. We'll leave that one at that. Um, I've also seen a tweet from yourself a couple of weeks back um, from high level, like. Can you help me understand why an L2 using Ethereum for data availability would not be able to um, operate in a parallel execution environment? Yeah, yeah. So the biggest limitation on Ethereum right now is bandwidth constraints at the base layer. Um, and essentially, like I, I guess earlier today, there was also the Dane Kuhn upgrade that happened. So I'll go over what things look like before Dane Kuhn, what things look like with protodank sharding, and also what'll, what they'll look like um, with Dank sharding. 
Um, but essentially, the way that rollups work is, or any essentially any type of layer two that is using Ethereum for DA, there's off chain computation that happens, and then there will be data that gets written on chain. Um, with rollups, this will be like with an optimistic rollup, this will be uh, compressed transaction data that gets written on chain. Um, and each byte of each byte of data that is written on chain, um, this requires a certain amount of gas. I think it's around 15 gas um, per byte of data that is written on chain. If you do all the math, like there's a target of 15 million gas per block, there's a certain amount of data that is used for each type of transaction. Um, so you end up getting to around 6,000 uh, transactions per second that can be supported. Um, if you're using like Ethereum call data to write all this, uh, to write all the rollup um, transaction data into. So this would be 6,000 transactions per second. Um, if the entire L1 block, was used purely for rollups. Um, in reality, there'll be a lot of other contention happening as well. There'll be like Uniswap and Blur and all the other activity that's happening on the base layer. Um, so there will be like, it just becomes infeasible like to be supporting something that has thousands of TPS happening off chain for that to be able to write the data to the base layer. Um, with protein sharding, uh, protein sharding doesn't actually solve this problem of bandwidth constraints. Um, it does help with gas fees uh, but it doesn't really in increase bandwidth at all. So there's going to be a target of, I believe, eight blobs uh, per block with protodank sharding. And if you do the math around like how much data that actually is available um, and how much it costs, it ends up being around a 10% improvement in the amount of throughput that you're able to, in the amount of throughput you're able to process. So around like 6,600 transactions um, across all the layer twos that are writing to these blobs. Um, so once again, like if you're trying to use proto-dank sharding, it doesn't really solve the problem around bandwidth constraints. Um, dank sharding would theoretically help over here, um, but that is like much, much further away. So if you want to have some kind of higher um, higher execution layer two, uh, you can't really be using Ethereum for DA, and you'd have to consider using something else for DA, such as like you mentioned Celestia, Eigen DA. Um, that would help you get the type of bandwidth that you need. So then you can have higher performance happening on the execution layer. You can make use of the DA layer um, and not really be hamstrung by it. Uh, and then you can use it there for settlement so that you're able to get uh, kind of that, uh, the trust guarantees that you would want and the security that you would want as well. Great explanation. Yeah, that makes, makes a lot more sense now. <laughs> if you are pushing towards um, this parallel stack product, why, why would you choose and this is like i'm just asking an open-ended question here like why would you guys choose to as i say push towards a, a kind of stack business model on top of what you guys are already building does that increase competition does it not increase competition like how do you think about that from like a, a business sense yeah i mean so first of all like our goal is to scale dvm um and we think that this is a natural next step in terms of like, we've already built this execution layer. It makes sense to democratize access to it uh, because there's already a ton of demand to be getting access to this um, higher performance block space. Uh, in terms of being competitive, I don't actually think that this will end up being like any rollups or I guess any layer twos that are making use of this uh, would end up being competitive, would say. And I think case studies that you can look to over here would be like Solana would be one example. Um, there are teams that are making use of the SVM to build uh, layer twos, um, but they're not really competitive with Solana at all. Uh, in fact, what ends up happening is they end up leading to significantly more mindshare going back. And it doesn't really result in whatever these layer twos are vampiring the base layer. Um, the base layer is where all the innovation has happened. The base layer is where there's all of the initial um, liquidity and users as well. So it doesn't really end up being a scenario where like the layer two is vampiring the layer one. Um, what does end up happening though, is if you need dedicated block space, for a particular type of use case, that ends up being quite possibly the best way for you to get access to that. So yeah, I mean, I think a more succinct answer would be no, it doesn't really lead to any competition. Yeah, and like the only thing, the only thing that's kind of concerning me, and I suppose a lot of others, and and don't get me wrong, there is a lot of infrastructure coming out to kind of resolve this, but um, just the fragmentation across um, L2s without the truly composable interop that you would like to see. Um, and I just want to like ask from the parallel stack perspective, is the sequence, is the sequence like a, a, a large focus? Is this kind of 
an additional like kind of nice to have that's built into the parallel stack or is it primarily focused on just democratizing the access to parallel EVM for um, L2s? Yeah, I, I think in the longer term, the sequencer will be a pretty critical part of this um, because as you mentioned, like right now, if you just have your own kind of dedicated roll up that or dedicated layer two that is not interoperable with others, uh, it does lead to more UX kind of issues around fragmentation of liquidity and around being able to interoperate with other layer twos. Um, if you have a shared sequencer, it does make it much easier to offer different types of composability. Um, instead of having like pure async composability, you can move towards different flavors of synchronous composability. So I think there's a pretty strong value proposition around having a shared sequencer that is connected to other high performance chains um, that allows you to have like different flavors of synchronous composability. Yeah. And obviously like one of the kind of glaring questions, if you're going to run something in a much more performance system, um, hardware requirements as opposed to what traditional systems would be running on now is there any spec that you guys have released or is that still kind of closed off yet or what, what does that kind of yeah. look like and what's the lift look like for people who would like to run this yeah so for cv2 i mean the uh, if you go to the cv2 docs it has the hardware requirement hardware requirements written over there um it's 64 gigabytes of ram which i would say uh so compared to like what you would see with other chains it's roughly twice uh, the amount of ram that you would want um mm -hmm. But I guess kind of taking a step back, what parallelization lets you do is it lets you take the existing hardware you have and make the best use of that hardware. So you can technically use parallelization with like the exact same hardware requirements and be able to get higher performance from that because it's software changes that will be scaling with whatever the underlying hardware is. So you don't actually need to have higher hardware requirements. Um, in this case, that does lead to slightly better performance. So that's what um, from like kind of trade-off curve, like that makes the most sense for SIT. Uh, but if other folks they realize that like they do want to have like lower full node requirements for their layer twos, um, they they could keep continue using the exact same uh, requirements as what you would see with other Ethereum rollups or Ethereum layer twos, um, and uh, still get better performance from that. Okay, cool. Um, and what's next? Like, where where are we at with with this rollout? Like, what what's coming like over the hill? Like, and what should people kind of be aware of? Yeah. Um, so right now for say v2, uh, there's a public devnet that is live. Um, that supports everything that we just discussed. So people can go over there, uh, play around with it. Uh, next step there would be the governance proposal that needs to pass and then afterwards upgrade to mainnet. Um, that'll happen sometime later. I guess it's already, or it's still March right now. So that'll happen sometime this half. So sometime Q2 of this year. Um, afterwards, the parallel stack would be something that our team is spending a lot of time on. Um, so there'll be more updates around timelines and around initial partners uh, later on this year. Cool. And is there anything that you'd personally like to see built over there on V2? On V2? I I mean, right now there's a lot of like really high quality Ethereum teams that are going to be launching uh, instances on today. What I'm really excited about is seeing native builders playing around with this 100x improvement in throughput um, and being able to build out better um, better types of product from that. So Safe Foundation is setting up an EIR program, an entrepreneur and residence program. Um, if you guys are interested in potentially learning more about that, um, there's a lot of support that Safe Foundation can offer. Um, so you could just go to the Say Network Twitter um, and reach out and the team will be able to assist you there. Awesome. So anyone listening who wants to go and check that out, I'll leave, I'll leave all the links in the description as well. But Jay, is there anything else that I might have forgot? Oh man, this is a great conversation. I appreciate the time. Yeah, you know, thanks, thanks very much. And if there's any any point or when you guys are rolling out and you want to come back on, just let me know and uh, we'll run it back. But um, excited to see it all happen. Um, hope everyone enjoyed that. Please give us a like and subscribe. I'm terrible at asking, and our producer keeps shouting at me. So please do that so I don't get beaten off him. <laughs> um, right, Jay. Thanks very much. And um, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a like, subscribe, and turn the notification bell on for next time.